night. And uh, tonight's uh, session two in this second part of Foundations of Our Faith. And uh, so session two of part two. Making sure the tape's spinning, which I think it is. And tonight we're talking about the new creation in Christ Jesus. Introduction. So far in our study of the foundations of our faith, we've discussed who Jehovah is, mankind's fall from grace, the spiritual dimension, the Bible view of the old nature, and who Jesus is. In this lesson, we'll consider Father God's view of the new creation. What does born again mean? What authority has Jesus given us, and how does Father God see us? B, Jesus, the perfect pattern. So you fill in there as perfect. Jesus is the preferred pattern for each human being to be conformed to, the new creature. He's the very nature of the Father and expressed in physical form. As we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, we're being conformed to the image of Christ, and we are being molded and shaped into the very way Jesus would act and think in the situations we face in this life. Some of the molding will not be pleasant as we are being changed from the very heart of our being, the old nature. But Father God molds us by giving us life choices, by gently teaching, by the guiding of the Holy Spirit, and thus we make the tr that transition from the old to the new. We were never expected to make this journey alone. It was very important that Father God sent the one who could help us through this journey first before he expected us to do it. We must reach for the Lord's help and teaching when we are in the midst of the battle, the trials of this life. It is his life flowing through us that gives us the victory. Now, just before I go on, um, I want you to imagine uh, a little, sort of like a parable, I guess. And it goes something like this. Uh, I'm just going to pick on Nick. And Nick has just given me an electric drill for Christmas. Some of you have heard this before, but it's worth reminding you of this. He's given me an electric drill for Christmas, and it's all nicely wrapped up. And Nick paid $200 for it. And this is a very male-type present because us men, we like uh, gadgets that can punch holes through solid concrete. So I'm thrilled with this, but I don't know it's in there because I haven't unwrapped it. So he gives me this gift, nicely wrapped. I don't open it up. I don't know what's in there. And how useful is the drill to me? It's not useful at all, is it? Did he pay the price? Yes. Is it a free gift to me? Yes. But it's useless, isn't it? Say, and and you know, salvation's like that. Um, um, you know, the promises of God are like that. A healing is like that. Deliverance is like that. You know, Jesus has done all the work. I mean, people uh, theologically, people get into these doctrinal battles, and they say, "Well, all the work's done." Some of you have come from churches like that where the church leaders have said, all the work is done in Christ, you know, uh, th there is no more, we don't have to worry about deliverance, we don't have to, uh, uh, you know, go over old ground, because it was all done at the cross. Now, if that was true, then salvation should be automatic too, shouldn't it? Did Jesus die for the whole world? Does it say in John 3:16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son? Yeah, so... You know, salvation should be automatic because Jesus died on the cross. Is it? Well, it's not, isn't it? Why not? Because I have to make a choice. I have to receive the gift. I have to open it. I have to appropriate the gift. I have to use the gift of salvation. Now, deliverance or healing is not any different. You know, I have to open the gift up for it to be useful. Did Jesus do the work? Yes. Is the work done? Yes. Has it been paid for? Yes. Is it a free gift? Yes. But, hey, if I don't make some choices here, it's not going to be useful to me. So when we start talking about the new creation, some people say, well, we're new creatures in Christ. There shouldn't have to be any counseling. Well, if that's true, we're new creatures in Christ, we shouldn't have any salvation calls because everybody's saved. It doesn't work like that. You understand it doesn't work like that when it comes to salvation, but a lot of people get conned that it works like that when it's uh, talking about the gifts of the Spirit or anything else. Now, I was not born 
I was not born saved. In fact, uh, David says uh, that we're born in iniquity and conceived in sin, and I'm a corrupted creature from the day I was born. And what I need to do is surrender and allow God to create the new cre creature or creation in me now and grab a hold of that and, and say, I want that thing. I'm, making, I'm going to make a life choice that I'm going to refuse to operate out of the old nature and I'm going to operate out of the new. Any questions? Okay, let's, so that's the context of what we're looking at this, okay? What does it actually mean to be the new creature here? But don't get tripped up by people that just say, you know, uh, it's all been done and there's nothing for you to do. Because there's God, God we're, put, we're in partnership with God here. He did his bit, I got to do my bit now because we're in partnership. We're co-workers in Christ. See, what is it like when we first come to Father God? What is it like when we first come to Father God? We start with a mixture of pain and selfishness. We start with a mixture of pain and selfishness. We all come to Father God with the baggage of the old nature. We inherited a whole package of traits from the previous generations, being taught things in our childhood and teen years, plus we've added to the old nature by choosing sin and rebellion before we came to God. The old nature includes all the ways we lived before coming to Christ, our motives, assumptions, ambitions, goals, values, desires, longings, imagination, expectations, intents, beliefs, needs, thoughts, all combined to make up the self-system the old nature. We drag this baggage with us into our Christian walk. The tendency towards sin is destroyed when we decide to walk holy. It is the old nature that causes the struggle for most, most Christians in their walk. The example of the two houses. And, uh, and basically, um, you know, the, the two houses are just uh, the, the parable of the house that was built on the sand or the house that was built on the rock. You know, our old nature is building a house on the sand. It's always shifting and moving and groaning and about to collapse around our ears where Jesus is the rock. Now, another confusion in all this is the difference between the old nature and the sin nature. And I make a distinction. I don't know if it's totally theologically correct, but I make the distinction between the sin nature which was destroyed at the cross, and the old nature, which I have, I still have, and I have to crucify daily. So I lump in the old nature as like the flesh, crucifying the flesh, Paul talks about. Uh, that is my tendency to be self-centered. I have to crucify that every day. But the sin nature is when I used to love sin, I don't love sin anymore. You know, the excess is a Dan Fengler once upon a time where I did something bad and I enjoyed it and then I wanted to do more of the bad thing, thinking that the more I did, the more I would enjoy it. You know, uh, if, if I had a, a little illegal sex, I'd want more illegal sex. If I had uh, a small amount of drug abuse, I wanted more drug abuse. That went to the cross. I have died. That, that thing's dead in me. I don't want to. I feel guilty now. You know, once upon a time when I sinned, I didn't feel guilty. But now I do. And that sin nature has actually died. That part has actually died. I don't enjoy sin. My sin nature died. But the self-centeredness of the old nature, I have to daily crucify that. Do I choose to live on the, in the house on sand or the house built on the rock? You know, I have to crucify the old nature and enter into the new nature. I have to make that choice every day, daily choices. You know, if I took the, this Bible and hit Priscilla on the head and she got hurt and offended, let's just see uh, if anyone's going <laughs> to, let's, let's just see if anyone's going to stop me here. But, you know, who's going to stop me? <laughs> well, I don't think so. <laughs> you can try. But, you know, who's going to stop me? At that instant of time, I'm operating out of Satan. I'm operating out of the old nature. And God, is, God would allow that if I seriously wanted to do that. Um, God may allow me to do that because it's, 
you know, there's pain in the world that we have contributed to, that we've all contributed to, out of the bad choices we've made. You know, that's still with me. Now, how I enjoy doing that, whether I enjoy whacking around the head or not, that's a different issue. And that thing's dead in me. You know, I'm not going to, I wouldn't enjoy uh, hurting Priscilla. Some people would out there, though. That's it. There's some people out there that would enjoy hurting her. Okay. Um, B, in the middle of the page then. When we come to Father God, we often feel the pain of the hammer of God in our lives. Often this is the stick because we have despised the carrot. You know the story of the donkey, don't you? Two ways to get the donkey going forward. You dangle the carrot so he's drawn by the reward or you give him the switch to the backside. You know, and God would rather I drew forward with the carrot. But people, he loves us too much not to give us the switch now and then. He'd rather we respond to the carrot. I, it may take traumatic, painful experiences to face the fact that the self is not capable of coping and that we need God in our lives. As helpers, we need to be aware of the motivator of pain in the salvation experience and act accordingly. We need to be careful of eliminating God's pressure by letting the client off the hook or the other extreme by ignoring, ignoring the traumas they're feeling. Now, just a reminder here, we originally wrote this whole course as training for counselors, and then over time it became more and more personal growth stuff. So every now and then we didn't eliminate all those references to clients and counseling. So please forgive us for that. Damien, yeah. When you encounter a client who's going through a hard time, does it matter whether, um, whether you work out if the hard time is due to the devil working there or whether it's got a stick working there? Because it will matter ultimately to the client's stick. Now, uh, okay, the, the question was, just for the tape, that uh, will it matter whether the pain is from God or from Satan? Um, basically, my, my theology runs something like this. Uh, Satan is God's servant. You know, just like you can read that, Nebuchadnezzar, God called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. So Satan comes along, has a legal right to afflict us in some area, and he does. And Satan's wanting us to experience pain just because he's a bad guy, you know, and he, and, he, and he loves seeing us squirm. But Romans 8 says what? That all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So God uses the pain that Satan's applying as the switch. Now, I'm not saying that God would never apply the switch directly. I'm not saying that, but, you know, I don't know what sort of proportions you put to it. Yeah. But mostly it's, if I stuff up and Satan gets into it, God allows the pain so that I'll repent and get out of it. Nick. I heard the analogy one time of a, a guy that took his kids to the, to, the, to the zoo, and they kept running off him all day, and he couldn't keep track of his kids, and they floor and pulling his hair out. And they run around one corner, right into where the wine exhibition, exhibit was, Yep. <laughs> yeah, ran right into the uh, misbehaving children running up to the lion cage and running back to dad because of the... That's it. Now, see, you know, this is not totally clear-cut, David, because, you know, uh, the Bible says that, uh, that God sent an evil spirit on Saul. You know, so does that mean that God actually uh, commands the demon armies and say, I want you, demon, go down there and bother that guy? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I prefer to think it uh, in the sense that Saul was messing up. There was an opening for Satan to get in. Satan's a bully. Satan's an opportunist. He got in there. God allowed it for God's purposes. But, but the Bible does say that God actually sent this thing. So Let's go on to see. The seeds of the new birth experience will be the drawing of the Holy Spirit to an alternative power source or life lifestyle. The counselor can help facilitate this process by leading the client towards true repentance and dealing with the self-life. That's crucifying the flesh. 
Number two, the importance of a proper birth. The importance of a proper birth. We talked a bit about this earlier in the course. It's important to check the depth, motivation, and reality of the conversion and the new birth experience. Much of Christian counseling revolves around remedial help for an inadequate birth experience with the Lord, one that lacked true conviction, repentance, and heart understanding about their choice. You know, if we did, if we spent more time slowing people down who want to become Christians and making it harder for them, uh, we'd be better off in the long run. And that's actually, we actually know that from church growth, that the more times that people have been challenged to become a Christian and have, and have, and have objected to it somehow, when they finally become a Christian, they're a whole lot more solid than those who in an emotional meeting said yes the first time without thinking it through. We, we actually know that to be true. Number three, the new seed needs nurturing, of course. The new seed needs nurturing. Just like the parable about the sower and the seed, where the stones, thorns, and sun's heat all combine to destroy the life of the seed, so Satan will try to destroy the work of God. Without adequate discipline and teaching, the new seed will wither and die. And the parable there in Matthew 13. D, we have been given a new birth. We have been given a new birth. Number one, what do we mean by the new birth? What do we mean by the new birth? John 3, 5, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. What do you think born of water meant at that point in Jesus' uh, ministry? Who went before Jesus? John the Baptist. And what was John about? Repentance, that's right. Jesus is referring to John the Baptist here because, see, being baptized in Jesus came after Jesus' death. See? So Jesus' reference to being born of the water here is referring back to John the Baptist. Repentance is part of what's happening here. Being, so someone who's repentant and then born of the Spirit. A, we need to get a clearer picture of what Jesus meant when he talked about being born again in John 3, verse 1 to 10. It's not enough to just admire the miracles of Jesus without having the personal experience of Jesus' truths. So let's just have a quick look at John. And we'll just read, I'll just read to you John 3, verse 1 to 10. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God not, were not with him. So what was, what was Nicodemus' proof that Jesus was from God? Miracles. But you also have to have a faith element here because a lot of the other Pharisees said, What about Jesus? That he was make, doing miracles from Satan, wasn't he? You know, so, so Nicodemus had a faith walk here in some way because he had a choice of either believing the miracles were from Satan or the miracles were from God. And Nicodemus chose to believe that the miracles were from God. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. So what's Jesus talking about here? Revelation, isn't it? I can't see unless there's a, a, a spirit within me that's capable of seeing. And guys, the, the frustrating thing about Christianity, but also the liberating, exciting things about Christianity, is that it's a religion of revelation. You know, if I don't see, it's very frustrating, and if I do see, it's very exciting. Uh, verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. What's happening here? Well, he's taken literally in the natural. So does Nicodemus have eyes to see? No, he doesn't. In fact, exactly, Nicodemus is demonstrating exactly Jesus' point. How can you see if you're blind? Of course, 
Nicodemus doesn't get that yet. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. And, and onward he goes. Okay. So Jesus said quite clearly what has to happen here. Why was it that um, Jesus expected Nicodemus or fellow teachers to understand the things to some extent? He didn't. He didn't understand them, but Jesus seemed to imply that maybe he should have. Well, but, but see, they, they've been caning Jesus all along, saying, you know, we, we, we're, we've got the truth and you don't. In fact, any miracles that you do, they're from Satan, and we're discounting them. And Jesus is just saying to this learned man, top of, top, top of the, you know, Professor Nicodemus, hey, Nicodemus, if you're so smart, how come you don't understand this? So he's using, um, you know, he's using this expectation, well, if you're so smart, you should be able to see this, to point out the fact that there's a big flaw in the whole caboodle, and that is, if I'm blind, how can I see? If, if, I've, if I've actually got, can only see in black and white, literally, then all the colorful things that are in this room, I see in what? Black and white and shades of gray, don't I? And you can tell me that that's red in, that, in, in your shirt there, or that's brown, or that's blue. Are the words red, brown, blue going to mean anything to me? And, but the Pharisees were insisting that they lived in a black and white universe that has scales of gray. And Jesus says, guys, there's color out there. You know? But if I'm arrogant enough to think that black and white uh, vision is all there is, then I'm not going to see. So the first thing I've got to convince you is that there's another world that's color. Then you'll say, oh, maybe I am inadequate. Maybe I do need some help. Maybe I do need some eyes or spectacles or a doctor or something. And that's what Jesus is gently trying to show Nicodemus here, that uh, he's blind and uh, he needs to be born again in order to see. Okay, back to your notes. Ephesians 2.8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not yourselves, it is the gift of God. And one of the things, of course, the Pharisees kept doing is saying, well, we've got the truth, we're so smart, we're clever, you know, you're dumb and we're clever. And, and again, Jesus is saying here, hey, this is a gift from God. This only comes from God. Let's give credit to where credit's due here. It's not by your works. It's not by how well you dress or what church you attend. It's totally a gift from God. And by the way, some of you struggle with why can anointed leaders of God muck up so badly? You know, why can they commit adultery or molest little girls and things like that. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us because if I give you a book, truly, if I give you this book and it's a genuine gift, can you use it however you want to? Can you start fires with it? Can you use it for toilet paper? Well, sure. If it's a gift, it belongs to you. You can use it however you want to. A true gift has no strings attached. If I give you the gift of salvation, there's no strings attached. How you use it, that's up to you, because it's a gift. And that's why people misuse gifts, because they are gifts. A true gift has no strings. If I give you this book and I say, now, make sure you take good care of it, John. Uh, make sure you put plastic on it. You're only allowed to use it on Sunday. Don't drink coffee while you're reading it in case you splash on it. That's not a gift then, is it? A true gift is without any strings. And so, hey, people, we can misuse the gifts. Which is why, why we get confused, because uh, a lot of churches say, we're not going to operate in the gifts because they've been misused. Well, of course they have. 
You know, why wouldn't they be? How many uh, six-year-olds have you seen that if you gave them a Gideon's Bible, they'd throw it at each other, throw it in the bin, or, you know, use it to prop up their bicycle wheel while they're changing the tire or something? You know, I mean, what do we expect? Sure, they're going to do that. Okay, let's move on to um, B, in the middle of the page there. Conversion and the new birth is something we do and experience as well as something supernatural that God, God does for us. C, the process begins when we commit ourselves to Jesus, receiving him as the answer from God. Our obedience is symbolized in the act of water baptism and a union with him that brings freedom from sin's domination. We can walk in a newness of life by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, ultimately resulting in the new spirit body we receive at our resurrection. Again, you know, who is perfect? Jesus. Am I perfect? Only in as much as I'm in Christ. Have I been perfected in some ways? Yes, I have. Uh, by salvation. Salvation is a perfect act. Am I being perfected? Yes, as I'm crucifying the old nature. Sanctification as I'm being set apart. You know, as I uh, become more like Jesus and I sin less, I'm being perfected. And will I be perfect one day? Yeah, in my body, I'm going to get a perfect spirit body one day. You know? so, so we've got, we have this process, and, and uh, uh, if you haven't heard this, but this is very important. For some of this stuff to make sense to you guys, you need to understand one principle, and that is we have the, uh, the uh, legal basis, the ideal, and then we have the real, or the experiential. We have a whole bunch of promises from God that are perfect, such as a perfect body, and a perfect spirit, and a perfect soul one day, perfect heart, no tears. And then we have the process that's moving us through time and space and growth to that. Now, experientially, I'm here right now, and is Daniel perfect? Not in the natural. But I'm legally perfect in Jesus, aren't I? So we have this constant theological tension all the time of the perfect, the ideal, and then the real that hits me in the here and now. Yeah? And there's that constant, all the time, we're balancing this thing. How can this be? And, and let me just give you a quick illustration. Let's say... Uh, uh, let's say I die and I leave Maureen my little red car. Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you'd be pleased by that. So I leave in my little red car. Uh, sorry, I don't die. In my will, I say that Maureen gets my car. Now, uh, legally, is the car hers if I die? Yes. But while I'm still alive, she ain't getting it. You know, She actually doesn't have the keys and can't drive it around. Even though legally it's hers, when I die, she doesn't have it. There's all these promises, guys, that are legally ours, but there's conditions that have to be fulfilled before I can experience it. And, uh, and that's a really important principle. And unfortunately, some people just come along and give us the ideal and say the ideal is now. I am not sick. <coughs> I'm not sick. <coughs> You know? And they keep confessing they're not sick as though that's going to actually make them whole. Well, that's a lie, isn't it? That's not real. Nick? I was going to say, I've been the rest of my life understanding what it is that happened the first day I gave my life to Jesus. Yeah, I think that would be right. I'm going to spend the whole life understanding what happened. You don't want me to understand and make sense. It's just practice. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and it has been like that ever since. Yes, Brenda. So, do we become completely perfect in Christ? Or do we just become completely perfect in an area like as in victory over something? I know not perfect. I'm thinking of Paul because Paul says, you know, you can do what I do. You know, you'd be following what I am because he felt confident to say he felt like he was 
going well. And okay, if, if, I, if, if I could actually be perfect in my own self-effort, we wouldn't need Jesus. And as Paul follows Christ. Okay? And like any, any teacher, uh, a teacher, one, one of the tricks of the trade is that all you've got to do is be one day ahead of the kids. You know? That's all you got to do. you got to just read the chapter the day before they read it. You know? And that's one of the tricks of the trade, you know? And all i got to do is to help you, pull you towards Christ, is be one step further towards Christ than you are. But that doesn't make me perfect. That just means I'm that one step closer so I can help you along. And you should be turning around and helping somebody else along that one step that you're ahead of them. And so it goes. And so none of us is perfect. Legally, I am. But in my experience in the here and now, I'm not. And, and, and by the way, Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, a, a, a demonic messenger. I think deliberately God let him have that so that Paul could never think he was perfect in Paul. He was only going to be ever perfect in Christ. And that, whatever that little thorn thing was, whatever it might be, uh, that infirmity, whether it was in the spirit, soul, or body, God allowed him to have that infirmity to say, Paul, there's always a limit to your sanctification is never in your own self-effort. You cannot ever achieve it. Yeah. Don't ever think you can. You need to be thinking grace here. I am totally inadequate, but God's gift and grace to me, that's what makes the difference. It's not Daniel that makes the difference, it's God that makes the difference. In the counseling, if anybody's coming to me and getting something good they take away, it really is God, it ain't me. You know, Because I know how corrupt and how stupid I used to be in the things of God. That's right. That's it. That's it. Only God gives that spark of illumination. Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, number two, we are bought with a great price. Jesus' death was a great sacrifice. God's attitude is not, it doesn't matter the sin that was committed, but rather the great price he paid covers the great sin of mankind. Don't ever forget that grace is not about that God said it didn't matter. No, it mattered so much he killed his own son. Now, grace is about the fact that God demands justice, but he loves mercy. Someone had to die here. It was either going to be Dan Fengler or it was going to be Jesus. Someone had to die. But Jesus took my place. Number three, we're now on a journey with Father God. We're now on a journey. And I like that word journey. I know it's sort of new agey, you hear it a lot, and when you go to seminars, journey, journey, but it really is. There's events, and then there's process. And that process, that journeying, that moving, going from glory to glory, becoming more like Jesus, being refined, uh, that's a much better concept than an event that just took place once and you never have to do it again. Now, yes, there is an event where I confessed, you know, I said the Lord's Prayer, and an event happened there where I was born again. But the outworking of that is a process of sanctification, or as Paul says, uh, working out our own salvation, soteria, which is a wholeness concept. With God's help, there's still things to do, for me to do, not for him. Um, in your notes there, the wounds of trauma and abuse go deep, and we must all feel compassion for the broken and damaged. The abundant life we are designed to enjoy with Jesus will include what the Bible calls sanctification or regeneration. Once the new Christian begins to recognize the self-life, there is a choice. The old nature will always be with us on this corrupt earth. However, the sin nature, that which inspired, encouraged, and enjoyed sin, died with Christ. And that tells us that in Romans 7. 
And that's why I make that distinction. Number four, salvation must be accepted. Salvation must be accepted. Salvation is providing is provided as the free gift from a righteous God, acting, so it should be A-C-T-I-N-G, acting, if your notes haven't been corrected, in grace towards the undeserving. It is a gift of faith, meaning trust in what Jesus Christ has accomplished with his life and death is required. There is nothing that we can do to earn this gift. Our good works do not add to Jesus' covenant with Father God. This acceptance of Jesus' work brings God's part of the covenant into action. E, we must implement our new position in Christ Jesus. We must implement our new position in Christ Jesus. Few Christians really know the good news. Uh, the story of Lady Jane Grover. Um, I asked Susan if this is a true story. She said she didn't think so, but I actually do think it is a true story. But the story goes like this in any event. Lady uh, Jane Grover is dying, and, uh, and there's a plaque on the wall that she got from the king. And, uh, but she'd never, been able, she'd never read it because um, she just framed it like a work of art and plastered it on her wall. And before, she said, before I die, I want to know what that thing says because I can't read. And so a visitor to her house, and she's living in abject poverty. I mean, just absolute destitute. And this man reads the, the visitor reads the, the, this plaque out, and it basically is making her a, a lady with a, 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 an estate. She's a very wealthy woman because the king gave her estates and stables and cattle and mansions, but she didn't know she had that because she couldn't read. And she'd left, lived in poverty all her life. You know? And that's what Christians are like. We look around and we say, why are they living so in such poverty? You know? And it's, it's not because God has not given us the good things. It's because we don't know how to read. We're spiritually blind. We're ignorant, we're full of pride, uh, we've got generational curses. I mean, there's lots of reasons why. But I want to tell you, it's not God's fault. He's given us the prize, and his name is Jesus. That's right. Yep, exactly the same. It's a great story. Mephibosheth. Number two, I must accept and live my position in Christ. I must accept and live my position in Christ. We can visualize a relationship with Jesus as being surrounded by freely given gifts. An electric can opener will be totally useless unless I open the package and plug it into the power source. So it is with my position in Christ. I must accept what Jesus has done, receive it, and empower the promises by the Holy Spirit. F, how God has delivered us. How God has delivered us. The Apostle Paul explained God's salvation through the use of legal metaphors. When Paul talked about our position in Christ, he used words of Roman Greek legal life. Number one, God's intent in giving us salvation. And just reading from 2 Corinthians, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Transformation is a much better word than many others because it's got that metamorphosis, like a caterpillar turning into a cocoon, turning into a butterfly. And, um, and uh, you know, Dan Fengler has metamorphosed from a, a rationalist male, uh, ignorant of the things of God, into a spiritual man. And that's only by the grace of God. It's not because Dan Fengler was clever. Quite the contrary. I'm the proof that God did it in spite of me, not because of me. You know? Now, some of you I know are struggling in some of your life issues. And you're going, well, why isn't it happening to me? Well, I can't answer that except to say this. I, I need to press it. You know, whenever I have a choice, I, I chose Jesus. I chose the Spirit. Whenever I had a choice. 
And I went through plenty of hard times where it seemed like God didn't exist and he wasn't available to me. And persistent paid off. Just keep going in the direction of God. Just keep going in the direction of God. How long does it take? I don't know. Just keep going in the direction of God. You know? But things will change because it's his, in, it's Father Heart of God that things would change. He doesn't want it to stay. I mean, before some of you came in, there's a guy I've, I've, I've seen before and talked with uh, who's married to a Buddhist. Very, very uh, strident Buddhist. And he came in here going, whoa, 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 you know? Guess what, Daniel? I go, what's happening? And he goes, my wife gave her heart to Jesus last weekend. You know, like, this is, this is, this is not possible. This, this die-hard Buddhist that used to slander Jesus all the time and give this guy heaps, she's become a Christian. You never know when that breakthrough's going to come, guys. You never know. Um, I, I prayed. I had people praying for me for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for six years, and nothing happened. And it was agony, you know, because, you know, I mean, I'm getting tired of this. God, when are you going to give me this thing you said that you're going to give me? And, and nothing happened. But I recognized a couple of things. One, that I didn't really want it. I wanted it because other people had it, but not because I saw the necessity of why God would want to give this thing. So I didn't really want it. It was a very selfish thing why I wanted it. And I had to understand it a bit more clearly and do research on the baptism before I, before my heart was really ready to receive. You know, and of all the weird places, it wasn't in some nice church scene with the, the senior pastor laying hands on me. It was at my mother-in-law's place. You know, we're sitting all around. I don't know how it all happened, but, you know, she prayed for me, and all of a sudden I felt different. And when I looked at the Bible the next day, it made more sense. And the colors in the room were brighter. You know? Weird. You know, six years of, of agony, getting people to pray for me and pray for me and pray for me. Nothing happened. And then I still couldn't speak in tongues, one of the gifts of the Spirit. That took another 18 months of agony. So some of you that are doing it hard, look, I know about that. All I can tell you is keep going towards God. You know, keep moving in the right direction and be persistent. As Paul would say, finish the race. You know, guys, don't give up the race when you're, you know, three yards away from the finish line. Yeah, you might say, but how do I know where the finish line is? That's true. So just keep going. Just keep going. You don't know where the finish line is. Back to your notes. A. Soteria is a New Testament word meaning to be made whole, to be delivered, made safe, preserved from destruction. It's a word that both infers completeness and an ongoing process. So salvation does not just mean having eternal life, guys. It's actually much bigger than that. It's talking about a wholeness uh, where it says just like that, to be delivered, to be made safe, to be preserved from destruction. It's a word that talks about completeness, but it is an ongoing process. B, we are in need of salvation from the evil and corrupt world, from ourselves and from the enemy that wants us destroyed. It's God's intention to make us whole and spirit, soul, and the future perfect body. Number two, we are forgiven. We are forgiven. And 1 John 1, 9, which all of you has memorized. I'm not super keen on... You know, I know a lot of people say you should memorize big slabs of the Bible. Some people have good memories for that, not me. But there are some scriptures that are just so key. They sum up nicely a lot of uh, uh, biblical truths. And John 1, 9 is one of those. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All. What does all mean? Everything. Does that include everything you've done? Yes. In your text there, this means the remission of a debt. That is, uh, you know, forgiveness in a biblical term is I owed God a thousand dollars and he came along and he ripped up the IOU and said, you don't owe it to me anymore. 
As sinners, we stood before God as debtors, owing God. In Christ, we've been declared out of debt. Our debt has been discharged. We owe nothing. Yes, we owe nothing. Three, we have been redeemed. We have been redeemed. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Remember, these are all both theological, but the reason why they're big words is they're, they're also legal words in Paul's time. The Greek words are legal words. We have been redeemed. This is a buying out. As sinners, we stood before God as slaves. In Christ, we are declared free, exonerated. Instead of slavery, we have freedom. So the redemption is where you pay a price and you buy back the slave. So Jesus has paid the price and we're no longer slaves. Number four, God has arranged the propitiation of our sins. It's a nice big word, propitiation. P R O P I T I A T I O N. Propitiation for our sins. Okay, so to bear, to be rid of, or carry the wrath. Jesus bore our sins on the cross, He took them to the cross. As it says in B, God has been offended by our sins and our unrighteous, rebellious behavior. The appropriate and fair penalty from a holy and just God would be death. He provided and paid the penalty for our offenses. He has released us from our punishment, having dealt with his wrath against our sins through what Jesus did. Isaiah 53 says, His substitute for our death was the death of Jesus, a pure and spotless sacrifice. He bore God's wrath and just punishment for us. He did not turn a blind eye and say our sins are rebellion did not matter. It cost Jesus plenty. Okay? So this propitiation is the substitutionary work where Jesus was whipped instead of me, where Jesus died instead of me, where Jesus bore the sins of the world instead of me. Okay, He took the punishment that I deserved. Number five, in Jesus we stand justified. In Jesus we stand justified. Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This which means acquittal. So justified means acquittal. As sinners, we stood before holy God as accused. In, in Christ, we are declared not guilty. Instead of condemnation, we have righteousness. And some people say it's just as though we'd never sinned. That's the outcome of it. It's as though we'd never sinned. But, of course, we did sin. Hebrews 10 says, Father God chooses not to remember the sins and lawless acts after his forgiveness is given. It is finished and done. This goes beyond the statement of just as though I hadn't done it. We stand before God with our sins wiped out, counted just as pleasing and righteous as Jesus. Do you realize that, people? You are counted by Father God as just as pleasing and righteous as Jesus. As pleasing and righteous as Jesus. That's how God sees you. We are just as acceptable to God as Jesus. We are now called his friend, his servants, and his son. Number six, we've been reconciled. We have been reconciled. 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Um, this word means, in A, it says this word means to make peace. As sinners, we stood before God as enemies, with Jesus as our go-between, we are led to peace. With Jesus beside us, instead of hostility, we have acceptance. He has judged our sins and dealt with the offenses by buying back our lives once and for all. The heart of man will not be successfully reconciled with Father God until we can deal with our feelings of rejection. The healing truth of reconciliation is what our hearts and minds need to encounter. 
There's a sermon somebody preached a while back. I, I don't remember which of the pastors, but the, the title of it is It's Okay to Come Home Now. That's reconciliation. It's safe to come home now. Yeah. It's safe to come home now. Daniel, it seems hard for me to see this happening at the same time as um, being aware of my old nature. And I guess maybe that's the old nature, focusing on the old nature rather than focusing on the fact that I've been reconciled and I'm a friend of God. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Exactly right, David. The, the problem is your old nature is actually getting you to focus on the old nature. You know, Satan's influencing your old nature to actually concentrate on all the dirt, where God's Spirit, quite contrary to how we see Father God, we, see, we tend to see Father God as a guy with a big stick that's sticking our nose in the dirt. But quite the contrary, what he wants us to do is look at this, the new nature, and say, that belongs to me. Jesus died so that I can have that, and I'm not going to let any guy cheat me out of it. You know, so having a bit of holy anger in there and saying, I am going to pursue my inheritance here. This belongs to me. I didn't deserve it. I don't care. You know, Maureen doesn't deserve my little red car either, but, you know, uh, you know, if, if that's in my will, she gets it. Well, this is the New Testament. This is Jesus' last will and testament, the New Testament. He has said, Daniel, you don't deserve this, but you're getting it anyhow. Now, if you're driving a rusted old Volkswagen, and I say, I want to give you a new Beamer, and you say, Duh, I don't really deserve it. Huh? <laughs> well... Knock yourself out, David. Keep driving, driving the old rust bucket, you know? You know, the thing's sitting in your driveway, and, you, and, you know, and the keys are in it, and, you know, and you're driving around your old rust bucket. Well, help yourself. Excuse a second, okay? Now, you can see the point. It's actually the new nature in me that's going to focus on the new nature, and it's the old nature in me that's going to focus on the old nature. So which one am I going to choose? It's all about choices, David. Maturity in Christ, moving forward in life, is all about choices. What choices do I make? You know, we keep thinking, um, uh, I can't believe that this would be, you know, that God would do this for me. And because we don't believe, we don't make the choice that would make it happen. What I actually need to do is make the choice, and then it will happen. Ah, but that takes, that takes some faith. That's a faith issue, isn't it? Now, I actually didn't have a whole lot of faith. I was just stubborn. I knew this didn't work, and I could see the potential for this. And I said, in all the choices I'm going to try to make, I'm going to keep picking this, and I'm going to keep picking this. As hard as it is, as much as I don't understand it, as much as it seems totally stupid and crazy to me, I'm going to keep picking this. So guess what I got then? that. Because which, what, what, whatever the choice is, that's what I'm going to wind up getting. And that's the whole point of tonight, David. You're, you're on to it. Let's pick this. This list of what we're looking at is what belongs to you. Are you going to pick it up and focus on it and run with it and say, forget, forget that, the dirt thing, you know. Uh, let the dead bury the dead. Let's just leave that behind and move on and apprehend that. Grab a hold of it. Unpack the package. Look at the drill. You know, use the drill. Discover how it works. Read the instruction manual, you know? Priscilla. I guess the, the question that I had was what about the place for conviction and, and working through things that, that God puts on that you need to deal with in your life? Is that still focusing on the old age? Because I don't know, there seems there'd almost be a tendency, it's like looking forward going, oh, I've got that, that's my inheritance, but there's still stuff that needs to be worked out. There's still selfishness that needs to be, you know... Okay, but, but, as, but as I'm focusing on this, as I'm focusing on this, and that beautiful world that it represents, some of my flaws are going to be exposed quite clearly. But I'm not dealing with the, with the flaws that are exposed because I'm trying to get there. Now, my, I already deserve to be there. In Jesus, it's already mine. I belong over. I don't belong in the old nature. I belong over here. This is me now. My inheritance. This is my passport. I, Dan Fengler, 
uh, am a son of the living God. My home is my home is heaven. I'm a, I'm 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 only here as an alien, walking around on this planet, uh, this little dirt ball. Uh, you know when 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 you know when I've got this glory out there, in 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 my home in my universe that belongs to my dad and me. You know, and I'm going to focus on that, and uh, and yeah, as I enter into that. There are crippling things that Father God says, well, Daniel, you better get rid of that piece of junk, you know. You've been hanging on to it way too long. You know, take it to the tip. Leave it out on a hard rubbish day, you know. Let them take it away from you. You don't need that anymore. You don't need that coping mechanism of sexual immorality or drugs or whatever. You don't need that anymore. You know, if you're in this environment and, you know, I've got my heavenly passport, it doesn't say German. It doesn't say Scott Irish, which is my ancestry. It says "Son of the Living God." Hey, that's me. That you know that that, that piece of junk there. I don't want that anymore. You know why would I? But of course, Satan comes along and says, "Oh, you want you you have to give it up. Won't that be terrible if you have to give up drugs and sexual immorality and this and that? You know, you're really going to miss it." Well, on a heart level, that's true. I'm going to miss it. Some of that stuff. But in my saner moments, I'm going, did I ever do any of that? That's horrible, you know? What a stupid thing to do. Man, I could have gotten into so much trouble. I could be dead by now. There but the grace of God go I. Now, let's walk over here. And yeah, sure, the repentance thing is just dropping off the rubbish. Repentance is just dropping off the rubbish and saying, God, I don't want it anymore, you know? I don't want to do that anymore. Please forgive me. Take it, take it away. Take it to the tip. Let's stop and have a cuppa. We're on number seven on page six. We have been adopted into his family. We have been adopted into his family. Hey, we have been placed as a son in God's family. As sinners, we stood before God as strangers not part of the family of God. In Jesus, we're made joint heirs and worthy of God's fellowship. In Jesus, we're made joint heirs and worthy of God's fellowship. B, in Christ, we have received sonship. <coughs> Instead of no rights, we have an inheritance, a family standing and dignity. C, the Romans family attitude towards their son was different to ours today. As their sons came of age, they would be adopted as an inheritor with all the rights and responsibilities. Until then, the child was regarded as more than a slave, but not equal with the father and older sons. So the concept of adoption in Roman days was the son is not really an inheritor until the father says, that's my inheritor and points the finger and they had a ceremony. And even a total stranger could be adopted into the family and take the place of flesh and blood. You know, so if I was Julius Caesar and uh, you know, I saw that Nick was uh, more likely to be uh, you know, a, a good ruler, then I would disinherit my own flesh and blood and adopt the stranger and he would take the place of my own flesh and blood. So the adoption had to do with being an inheritor. And each one of us has been adopted by God to be an inheritor. And it doesn't matter whether you were an enemy once, like I was. Eight, we have been given our down payment now. We have been given our down payment now. Galatians, Ephesians, and 2 Corinthians. We have been given a seal the earnest of our inheritance and the first fruits of his spirit in our heart. This is what makes us the new creation reality. God's Holy Spirit has come to live in our heart to teach us and to help us be conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, the earnest of our inheritance means um, a deposit. Uh, when, you go to a ha when you go and buy a house, you put a 10% deposit down. Okay? It's a holding deposit. And that earnest has that implication. Right now, Dan Fengler, out of, uh, out of my, my potential in God, 
I've got 10% now. I got 90% coming. Okay, let's go on to nine. The process of regeneration begins. You're feeling there's process? Father God's power is working in us to change us. He's not allowed us to continue the same self-destructive games we once knew. His aim is to bring salvation to us, a wholeness of spirit, soul, and body. The rebuilding process is at the heart of the good news of the gospel of Christ. Legally, we are perfect. Experientially, we're on a journey toward that perfection. Ephesians 1, 19-23, we're given hope by knowing that we have that spirit of wisdom and revelation. We begin to catch a glimpse of the riches of his inheritance. It is the same power that raises Jesus from the dead at work in us to help us change. 2 Corinthians 7, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The Greek word hagiosmos, meaning to make holy, purify, or consecrate, describes the process of growth for the Christian. Set apart for exclusive use, an inward transformation gradually taking place, resulting in purity, goodness, and moral godliness. That is why Paul could boldly say, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. We are now a type of being that has never been known before in the whole of creation. To be in Christ means that I have a new legal standing before Father God. My legal standing is that of Christ himself. I have his standing, his rights. I stand in his position before Father God. G, conclusion. One, God's perfect plan. God's perfect plan. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection have provided us a perfect path back to relationship with Father God. The salvation he offers meets all our needs, reverses all the lies the enemy wants us to believe, and satisfies all our inner drives for relationship with Father God. Jesus' work is so profound, so total, it reverses all the destruction we have known. The effects of the fall are corrupted inheritance from previous generations, what we learned in our childhood, and all the sinful, hurtful choices we made in getting to where we are today are all answered and healed in the work of our Lord Jesus. Now begins a process of regeneration. We're not stuck with the old mess, but we have begun a new life as a new creation with his resurrection power. His healing process now avails us so that we can enter into his glorious relationship. It is when we see ourselves as Father God sees us that we can get the right balance in our own effort to make ourselves perfect. God will never love us any less than he does now. How will he love us any more than he does now? Even if we worked on self-perfection from now until we leave this earth, the benefits of the new creation are for his kingdom and us. In our next session, next week, we'll start a two-part series on your place in church life. Homework, worksheets, and readings. Choose the best one for where you are with the Lord Jesus. One, spend time with the Lord Jesus on the subject of your old nature. Has there ever been a time when you really dealt with the self-issues? Have you come to a place in your Christian growth when you reckon yourself dead with Christ? If not, work this issue through with Him. And just while I'm on that, remember that counseling is all about band-aids. It's just uh, stopping people from bleeding to death long enough so that they can fondly give up their lives and die in Christ. Die to the self. Number two, meditate on the sheet, Who I Am in Christ. Which verses or promises do you have problem believing in your spirit or heart, not your mind? Pray this question about each promise. Lord Jesus, do I believe da-da-da-da in my heart? If you get no, then study the scriptures listed and keep studying those and other related ones until you get a yes answer. And we'll look at that in just a minute. Number three, what are our rights and privileges in Jesus Christ? We have many God-given rights and privileges with Jesus' covenant as we become adopted into God's family. Do you know what these promises are? And then finally, for some inspiration, consider the poem, 
The Garden of My Heart, uh, which Susan wrote a few years back. I think you'll find it interesting. First up, let's look at uh, Appendix A on page 9. First, our position is invisible. This is just sort of a wrap-up of what we've been talking about using slightly different words. Our position is invisible. Our position in Christ is absolutely true, but only visible to God. All spiritual things are invisible, but more real and abiding than visible things here on earth. Number two, it's not experienced emotionally. This is important. Our position in Christ cannot be increased or decreased. In Christ, we are totally righteous, fully forgiven, as we said legally, if not in our experience. All our sins from the past, the present, and the future have been paid for. And we need to walk that by faith, not just emotionally. Or especially not just emotionally. Number three, it is not given progressively. You do not have to wait to be a mature Christian for the legal standing in God. The moment you became born again, child of God, he declares all these wonderful benefits for you and for your life. Don't forget, it's a test, New Testament is the testament that Jesus left behind. It is your inheritance. And it, and it was left there for when you became a Christian, you uh, received the inheritance package. Number four, it is not given on the basis of merit. Our position in Christ does not depend on our goodness, our works, or our performance as a Christian. It depends on Christ's own righteousness and on his work. We have legal rights before Father God because of Jesus for uh, no other reason than the fact that we are in him. Remember, we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us. So I am inside the... Uh, totality of what Christ is. I'm actually in there like being inside a house where the house is Christ and I'm in the house inside. And if the, if the house is righteous, then me being inside the house means I'm righteous. Number five, our position in Christ is received by faith. The moment we believe in Jesus, we receive a new position in him. There is no difference between a new Christian and an older one in this respect. We are all complete in him. As I like to say people about deliverance, my authority in Christ to cast out demons is exactly the same as any of your uh, authority to cast out demons. The difference is that maybe I have more experience, but I have no more authority because... Jesus is complete. Number six. Um, it is contested by Satan, our position in Christ. Satan can never take your position in Christ away, but he'll try to blind you to the truth of it. He will try to rob you of its blessings. Satan tries to condemn us and steal our inheritance. He wants to keep us poor, unhealthy, and miserable. It's up to us to stand up and resist him and to maintain our rights in Christ. Our position in Christ is eternal. Since our position in Christ depends only on Christ, it will endure for as long as he, that is God, Jesus, endures. Okay, any questions? Okay, I think that's fairly clear. Let's, let's move on to the Appendix B, session uh, on page 10, uh, Who I Am in Christ. Now, as we said before, uh, just reading the instructions there, what I want you to do here is don't just know the following truths in your head. Ask Jesus, Lord, does my heart accept the truth that, and then you instate one of these statements, insert one statement from the list. If the Holy Spirit says no, then you study the scriptures listed and others until your heart accepts God's promises to you. So you keep working with it, uh, you know, get yourself a concordance, cross-reference, Bible. You do a bit of a study on it until, uh, until your heart accepts that promise. Then you go on to the next one. Do not continue to ask Jesus about other statements until your heart accepts the truth you're investigating. And uh, there's two pages there of all the promises that God gives us well, not all of them, but certainly a, a large collection of the promises that God 
gives us in the Bible. So go and do that. And as you know, for some of you it might take two weeks, for some of you six months or a couple of years to work your way through the whole sheet. Now, a rhetorical question here. If your heart knew every one of these promises in God, what sort of Christian would that make you? And as you can see, that you know, if your heart actually knew these things, uh, you would, you know, you wouldn't be acting like a worm. You'd be acting like an eagle. And uh, remember, you are an eagle. You're not a worm. And uh, you might, you, you might be an eagle that thinks it's a worm. But if your heart starts believing these promises, you will no longer think of yourself as a worm, but as an eagle, which is what you are. Okay, let's. Uh, Let's uh, just conclude here by looking at page 12, Appendix C. I'll just read this poem to you. The Garden of My Heart. My heart was like an overgrown garden when my Jesus rescued me, overgrown with thorns and briars, not a pleasure for my God to see. My walls were strong and tall, shielding my weakness from view, the extent of weeds, thorns and creepers, no one but he really knew. He became for me the door to the Father, the creaking rusted pain he replaced. Like the returning prodigal son I came, the steps of that journey retraced. The soil once designed for God's purity, now clogged with weeds had grown. Vines and trees, rampant and wild, a harvest for all the bad seed I'd sown. Not by your mighty effort, he then told me, can you make this garden bloom, but rest in the master gardener, will soon replace the gloom. So the hours of digging and pushing, of pruning, planting, and growth became such a glorious reality, and He did the work for us both. Jesus. Jesus. It's us in Jesus, and Him in us. Let me just pray. Father, I just ask that, that You would you would meet us in a place where we can experientially know you, where we can experience your manifest present, your, your presence somehow registering with us, that we know that you're here, that you know that we're with us, that we can sense your presence. And Father, just like Susan's poem that you gave her, and you did the work for you and her both. So Lord, the, the, the perfect love casts out fear. We need not have any fear that you're going to abandon us or not be with us. Lord, help us to receive that in our hearts, that you are faithful even when we're not. That we're not to judge ourselves. First Corinthians um, four tells us that we're not to judge ourselves in the sense of condemnation. Lord, help us to surrender to you and allow you to do the good work in our hearts, in our lives. And Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, guys, see you next week when we look at session three, the church, the body of Christ and look at some other foundations of our faith. Tonight, and uh, tonight's uh, session two in this second part of Foundations of Our Faith.